broadcast in 2014. Thank everybody who currently educating themselves in their community, their collective, their neighborhood, their family. And I thank everybody who basically been supporting Georgia University since their inception. You know, uh, with all I do, I'd like to welcome to the show tonight, um, elders and new African political prisoners, um, Adi Lugaba Shakir and Joker Jensei Hashim. How y'all, comrade? All right now. All right now. Hey, uh, uh, Oh, comrade Joker had to go to work today, man. The day was supposed to be his day off, but they got him out there working. Okay. So I'm doing the solo. Okay. Okay. I know you can handle the business. Good, yeah. bro. Oh, <laughs> uh, you know, hey, can't stop. Why won't stop? You know, wait to go to Salamu. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, man. Salutations. Salutations, man. You know, um, this is this is a beautiful time, a beautiful month, man, you know. But people must know that this is a culture. A culture and event that must take place around these five days a, a year, and not just right now. We've been resisting since yes. we've been here. Yes. Yes. yes hey, sir. and one of the things I did earlier this morning, I did a brief live on dialect and materialism from a New African perspective in relationship to where it's your ghost is. Black all is a constantly evolving process because it's related to our revolutionary struggle. It's not just about commemorating those who have given their lives to the cause. What did they fight for? What did they live for? What did they die for? It is also about that. It's all about our relationship with that struggle, with the revolution. A lot of times people just commemorate the comrades and move on after the 31st to their own little lives. That's not how you commemorate Black August. That's why there's a two-pronged component within Black August. You commemorate those who have given their lives to this cause. You continue that commemoration by joining the cause, fighting for the people, fighting for the revolution. It don't stop at August 31st. It continues 365 days a year. The Black August concept is constantly evolving because the ideology that gave birth to it is constantly evolving. We're fighting for the liberation of our people. We're fighting for their independence. How would that look 20, 50 years from now? We don't know. But our objective is to lay down the foundation. It's like when you build a house, you have to build the foundation. You have to have the blueprint and then build the foundation and then build the house. That's what we have to do. What blueprint are we going to leave our future generation? What is the foundation by which they're going to build the new house from? Black August speaks to that. Black August also have a component of dialect materialism, new African dialect materialism, not Marxist, not Lenin, not mild, none of them cats, but new African slash black delicate materialism. And as I elaborated on earlier this morning, this is relevant to see our struggle from new African eyes and new African perspective, how we see things, how we do things, not from a Marxist, not from a Stalin, none of them clown, how Davy Walker see things, how Marcus Garvey see things, how comrade George and Qatar see things, how Harry Tubman see it. DMR Vesti, Martin Delaney, Davy Walker. We do not have to import these foreign ideals and isms to understand our situation. And I want to reiterate what I said earlier today with regards to Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong recognized that many of the Chinese students coming back sounding like Marxists, sounding like Lenin, but they wasn't sounding like their own people. They would come back with these foreign ideals and concepts and ideology that didn't apply to their concrete conditions. But for us, we're bringing all those foreign ideals, and they don't fit our situation. Within the concept of Russian communism or China communism, there's a, a tool called concrete analysis and concrete conditions, analyzing the concrete conditions in your environment. That means that when you analyze those concrete conditions in your environment, it influences your ideological development. Those ideals that exist in Russia and China did not come from our concrete reality as new African slash black people in America. They came from the Chinese experience. They came from the Russian experience, the German experience, the Cuban experience, but not our experience. And then wonder why it don't work. Those ideas was based on our condition. If we understand the signs of struggle, we understand historical materialism. That means that our ideology must be indigenous to our struggle. Mao understood that. 
he made sure that they did not bring Marxist and Lenin to the country. He rewrote the concepts of what socialism and communism is based on the Chinese concrete reality. But I also tell brothers and sisters, why would you import an idea that didn't even work for them? If you look at China now, China is one of the biggest capitalist slash imperialist countries around. Russia is nothing social commerce about Russia at all. But yet you import those failed ideals and think we're supposed to implement them within our new African struggle. That don't even make sense. We have our own ideology development here. It started off with nationalism, then black nationalism, then revolutionary black nationalism. Now we're at the stage of new African revolution and nationalism. It has evolved based on the concrete realities of our situation. Black August is born from that process. The new African independence movement is born from that process. Establishing our own government is born from that process. One thing we have to do as revolutionaries, may you be part of the guerrilla movement or the Black Panther movement, We have to understand the tools of constructive criticism, critical analysis of ourselves and our organization and of our movement. Oftentimes, we don't have that capacity to do so, and that's hurting the movement. Because if I don't have that capacity to look into myself and see what I'm doing wrong or our organization or our movement, then there will never be a growth and development based on the needs and demands of the people. I always say that the revolution is about the people, not about us. That's a fact. Regardless of what I said, that's a fact. If you say that you're a revolutionary, an activist for the people, we're here for the people, then we have to listen to the people. If I establish a program in the community, let's say Black August, Memorial Black August Resistance, and if I establish that in the community, I have to go door to door and ask the people what they think about the programs and educate them about the programs and its intended purpose. And each day I have to ask them, what did they gain from that program? What can we do without changing its ideological component to better serve you under the banner of Black August Memorial and Black August Resistance? But that also applies to any program. If I establish a program that's designed to eradicate hunger from our community, it's not just about the program, it's about the effect it is having on the people. Oftentimes, we'll pat ourselves on the ass because we created a program, regardless of how it impacted people we say we're serving. Our success is not the program. Our success is how the program changed the lives of our people as revolutionaries. We can't claim success if, until it eradicate the problems that confront our people. So if I say that I'm going to put a program together that's going to eradicate hunger and starvation in our community, our success is based on achieving that goal. Because once you establish the program, people are focused on the program. I'm talking about revolutionaries, brothers and sisters. They pat themselves on the ass for the program. And I commend you for the program. But it's not based on that. It's based on is the program serving its purpose. Oftentimes when we create programs, we don't even talk to the people. We slap them in the face of the program. Here you go. Not even having the opportunity to even speak to the people. They understand their needs better than we do. How can you be a people's party, a revolutionary formation, and the people have no knowledge of who you are? They don't even see you. One of the reasons why the Black Panther Party was effective, the original Black Panther Party was effective, because they went door to door. My father, rat bastard, he had me going door to door to be a relationship with the people. Those relationships I've built with the people help me better understand their needs. And my father required that I write notes on a notepad of each person I went to go visit. And I gave it to him. And he gave it to other Black Panthers. So they apply the platform based on the needs of the people. We're not doing that no more. It is not right because I say it's right. It is inherent within the struggle. How can you serve the people's needs when you don't even understand their needs? How can you serve a people that you have no knowledge of? There are stages in our struggle. There are stages in revolution from social, cultural, political. Military arm, the armed military aspect is the last resort. 
when we have exhausted all legal means to liberate ourselves. We speak more about that opposed to the social, cultural, political aspect. When we look at our government, when we look at our community, we say, what does self-government look like? Because that's what the people ask us. You say self-government, what does that look like? Because we haven't seen it. What does independence mean? What does self-reliant mean? We throw these words out, but when the people step outside that front door, they don't see it. As I've often stated, when they have a basic need, they rely on our enemy. If their mother is sick or their father is sick, they pick up the phone. They don't call her. They call 911, 411. They call them the opposition, the enemy government that can't come and aid and assist them. If we can't fill in that gap, you can rest assured, you might as well throw in the towel. We're not going to win. The first step is winning the people over. You can't feed people on words alone. You cannot end or eradicate hunger, cultural ignorance, unemployment, poverty, with a bunch of revolutionary rhetoric. We have to have these institutions in our community that's going to provide them services. The people want to see and feel their success and independence. Not because we throw the word out there. It means nothing. We have to have an institution and community that tell the people, if your mother's sick or your father's sick, call us. We'll have an ambulance there with our own hospital, with our own doctors and nurses. And that's, that's practical. It can be done if we focus our attention in that area. But we play with the game when we try to mix the two. Like right now, they speak about uh, how this court system must bring justice for those families who loved ones got killed by pigs. Wait a minute. Is this not the same system that we're fighting against? At what point in time do they apply justice? You demanding justice from a system that is not just? That is a contradiction, and people see that. I'm not going to never demand justice from a system that has no understanding of what justice is. If they harm one of our loved ones, then we provide them with their justice until we get our own court system. But most revolutionaries don't see the contradiction in that. Monday through Friday, I'm fighting that system, but Saturday and Sunday, I'm demanding the system provide us with a service. But no one sees no contradiction in that. But then we wonder why we're stagnant because the contradiction are holding us back. The tools of dialectic and materialism identify the contradiction. Like when we use the concept of telescope and micro uh, of telescope, the telescope brings the issue to the forefront. The microscope allows to dissect the issue and analyze it like a contradiction. What is causing us to be stagnant in this particular state? That's the contradiction. Something is wrong there. But if you fail to analyze those conditions, objectively, not subjectively, nothing's going to change. One thing we fail to understand is that either you're growing or you're dying. There's nothing in between. If you don't water this plant, nurture this plant, it's going to die. It's not going to live. Same way with our struggle. If we don't nurture the right way and provide the right nutrients, it's going to die. How do we determine and define our success? Not by how well you have organized your organization, implementing your programs. Programs now facilitate liberation. Institution it does. We determine our sex success on the success of the people as revolutionaries. Always putting them at the forefront. Always. If they're suffering, from the a lack of their basic necessities, and we claim to be revolutionaries and vanguards, we have to look at ourselves and figure out what we're doing wrong or right. When we speak about unity among our people, we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing to achieve that? When I was young, like I stated previously, my father had me going door to door. He said, that's unity building. Because I'm going to door to door. I'm not just knocking at the door and running. I'm knocking at the door going in to speak with the elders, to be a relationship with the elders, 
elders that I learned that I have no question that I would live and die for at any time. I would go there and work for them, clean their house, help them clean their yard with no pay. Those are elders. And we'd be a relationship. I was able to get Mrs. Smith to miss, miss to meet Mrs. Cooper. Now Mrs. Cooper and Mrs. Smith is friends. I didn't add Mrs. Bowden to the circle. Now we're all talking. And it's changing. We have a barter system. Mr. Smith grew grapes. Mrs. Cooper had these big giant cauliflowers. They exchanged that food. We building the basic principles of unity. They communicated. We communicated. We knew their needs. We knew what time they went to bed. That's relevant because if the light is on at one o'clock, something ain't right. Because we we knew every move everyone in that community made. We understood the need. If you say you're a revolutionary movement, understand you have to analyze and study the original Black Panther Party. You have to. Yes, there was mistakes made that facilitated the demise, but look at the S and T's, the strategy and tactics they applied. They was going door to door. They built relationship with people, not just marching down the street with guns and fatigue. They had a reason for that. They patrolled them streets to protect our people from them pigs. And when the pigs stopped the brothers and sisters, the Black Panther Party was right there with their guns. And the difference between men and now, comrades used there. It wasn't just a show. They had an intent and purpose. The Panther was constantly present. They were going door to door. If you just like when I was growing up, I've never seen a member of the NWCP before. Never. Didn't know what they looked like. Didn't know what they looked like. How can you say you represent me when I don't even know who the hell you are? When I grew up, this is what I seen. The Black Liberation Army, the Black Panther Party, the Nation of Islam, the US organization. That's who I seen. I didn't see no United Negro College Funds and Operation Push, none of that cool stuff. I didn't see none of that. I knew who was there on the front line with us. You must be constantly present, not just marching and demonstrating, but at that door, building relationship, learning about the people, knowing about the people. Black August Memorial and Resistance allows you to do that because you create events that bring people to the maybe the culture center, the park, or even to your home. And you use that as a platform, a medium to build these relationships. Unity is something that we must work toward. We can talk all that unity stuff all we want to, but we're not making that effort. We have to make that effort. When we look at Kwanzaa, and I'm talking about the seven principles, not so much the Kwanzaa. Because those seven principles exist beyond the seven days. You cannot contain those principles within seven days. And if you uh, if you look at each of those principles, especially unity, self-determination, corporate economics, collective work responsibility, those principles are about liberation, independence. Liberation, independence. Not acculturation, not assimilation. They represent independence. So when we say self-determination, we're not just talking about, well, I have the ability and capacity to provide for my people, I mean, provide for my family. No, we as a people must have the capacity to do for ourselves. Maybe cooperative economics, collective work responsibility. Within the concept of Black August, those principles are revolutionary principles. Not a celebration, not a holiday. These principles are a way of life. We're not just going to come and beat on drums and wear dashikis and light red and black and green candles. Then after Kwanzaa, we back to red, white, and blue again. Black August, 365 days a year. We fight for liberation of our people every day. Regardless of what we wear, a suit or a dashiki, it doesn't end until the liberation of our people begins. Black August provide that platform. 
when we look at the failure of the movement, we have to look at the failure of its leadership. Can't get around it. That's all of us. I'm not just, I'm talking about us, me as well. Me and my comrades. We're constantly struggling. We're constantly trying to find a way to better ourselves. We're trying to find ways to resolve these internal contradictions. We don't hide that. No revolution of formation is perfect. None. But a lot of revolutionary organizations believe they don't, they are they say, beyond criticism. <laughs> they don't need no improvement. They're more of a threat than the asset because they're just in the way. Any organization that claims to represent the people, you have to step back at some point and reassess and reevaluate what you're doing. You have to reevaluate every program in that community that you have established. You have to. And you can only reevaluate that by going to the people. We used to create these uh, questionnaires around specific programs. So when we go to the community, we ask, how is this program? Is it providing you the services that we claim it should be providing you? What can we do better to improve this program? They answer those questions. Based on what they say, we go back to the drawing board and use that information to rebuild that program, to restructure that program. Remember, it's for the people. If you have a program that's not fulfilling its intended goal, then you have to go back and change that program. You have to reevaluate that program. You have to restructure the program. What was the whole purpose for creating that program? To achieve a specific objective. And if that objective is not being achieved, then you have to step back. That's part of the process. I remember when the United States, these clowns first attacked Iraq, and they had bombs. Them, uh, them bombs wasn't hitting their target, or the bombs wasn't exploding, right? Then you had revolutionaries that look at that, but they were being subjective. They look at that as, you see, they can't fight. Their weapons don't work. Check this out. In real time, some weapons are not going to work. Some targets are not going to be precision or precise. But you can rest assured that information of that bomb that didn't work goes straight back to a unit that reevaluate that information, reevaluate their problem. And that information going back to the manufacturer. And you can rest assured the next bomb that comes is going to work. The next time they want that precision to target is going to happen. They're constantly reassessing them. We don't do that. And I explained that to one of the brothers. No, bro. Yes, it did that. But that's, this is real time. You won't know these things unless you're actually in battle. Controlled environments do not produce the same result. But you put them in wartime. That's where you're going to learn this effectiveness. And you take the results of that and go back to the drawing board. You assess the strength and weaknesses. Their success and failure. That's what we have to do. We as revolution is no different than anyone else. If we say that we're a government, what issue do we have? Like within the Republic of New Africa, the provisional government, we have an issue of sexism. We have an issue that you have men who won't accept the leadership of sisters who are qualified. Qualified to govern. That's a chaos agent. Instead of contributing to strengthening our government, you don't contribute towards weakening our government. But yet you claim to be a new African revolutionary, a citizen of the Republic of New Africa. If we look in the mirror at ourselves and see what we're doing, it's all on us. I don't care what the government do or don't do. Remember, I don't believe in this government, so it doesn't matter what they don't do or do. I believe in my people. I believe in our government as New Africans. I believe in our revolution. I don't expect nothing from them clowns. Zero zip. Every morning I wake up is a surprise. They are who they they are who we say they are. I'm not gonna forget that. They fascists, racist, I don't care how many niggas they got in the government. That's part of the process. They don't give a damn about it and they show us that every time. We have to build people. Black August is a platform that allows us to build. We have to create our own institutions. Programs is temporarily. Institutions is required. 
what is preventing us from doing that? People speak about Comrade Dr. Matuta Shakur and his release. There's a lot of things that we can do, I believe, can facilitate his release. But it's the mindset of our people out there. I suggested that what we do, we reach out to the brothers and sisters in professional sports. Remember, they got family who still live in the hood. We can utilize them to reach out to them. You have brothers and sisters in collegiate sports. Both of these industries are billion dollar, multi billion dollar industries. And would not for our people, there wouldn't be nothing. We live in a Catholic society, and the only thing that matters to them is money. Money. That would get the attention if you tell brothers and sisters on the professional level and the collegiate level to step back three, four, five games. Don't participate. Just step back and then state the reason. We demand the immediate release of Dr. Matula Shakur. You know, that can be billions and billions of dollars. They lost in four or five games because of the advertisement and everything. There's a lot of things that we can use. Just going to them and say, please let them out, that ain't going to happen. Another issue we have to deal with is the COINTELPRO. Remember, the counterintelligence program was a crime committed against our people, our community, not just against the revolutionary, but against our people and community. It was a low-intensity war declared by this government, not by a Russia or China or any other, by this government. The same government that exists today, the same government that launched that war and approved that war against our people. We all was a victim of that war. Not just the organization that was at the forefront, but we was also a victim of that war. We got to demand justice, demand restitution, and part of that restitution is demanding the immediate release of those soldiers, brothers and sisters who failed as a direct result of the Cointel Pro. But they're getting away with their crime. I'm not depending on no Negro politicians to implement shit. Excuse my language. We have to implement our own committees and demand. We have to get lawyers who are sympathetic towards our situation. File a major lawsuit for what they've done to our community. I believe that can be done. It can be done. Many of us have to understand that we're not going to win the struggle separated, divided. The success of our struggle is a unified body. And I explain this to people. Even in the society that we're fighting for, even the liberation struggle, the independence of our future nation as New African slash black, however you identify yourself, is not going to be monolithic. We're going to have Christians. We have non-believers. We're going to have all kinds of people living within this nation. That's a fact. It's not going to be monolithic. So why continue to fight that struggle now? Well, I'm not going to ride with them because they are socialists, or I'm not going to ride with them because they are black communists. I'm not going to, yeah, that's foolishness. And believe my opinion, that's a form of escapism. Because you don't want to deal with the real enemy, so you'll find an enemy among your people. I'm not talking about those who are bluntly against us. I'm not talking about them, and I'm referring to them. Just like with the different Black Panther organizations. There's no way they should be divided that way. No way. They should be united as one in the service of our people if it's really about the people. If it's really about the people, before the Cointel Pro impact, the Black Panther Party, the original Black Panther Party, was united across the state. Across the state. If this fits about the people, the oppression in Texas is no different than oppression in New York. The same government that oppresses our people in Chicago is the same government that oppresses our people in California. So why do we have these different organizations with different causes and different objectives? Our people are under the gun in every state, every city. But we continue to create more organization, more organization, more organization. 
but we see nothing wrong with that either. And we're not even listening to the people call. I was talking to this one brother. I'm not going to say his name. He was ex-Panther in New Orleans, Louisiana. I said, bro, you are original Black Panther, my brother. And you leading the march trying to demand that the government do something in response to the devastation left by Hurricane Katrina. The same government that ignored your call before Hurricane Katrina. You knew before Hurricane Katrina that this government did not give a damn about you. You knew this, especially as the original Black Panther. You knew this. He get at me and said, yeah, you, I, you're right. I did know this. So I asked him, what did you do prior to Hurricane Katrina to prepare our people for a natural disaster? He told me it's not his responsibility. It's the government's responsibility. I said, oh, shit, I'm gone. I'm done. That's the type of contradiction that exists within our movement. You say you're a revolutionary, original Black Panther, and you're going to tell me it's the government responsibility to prepare our people for a natural disaster? Then take your revolution out your name, then. Take that Panthers out your name. Are you serious? It is our responsibility as revolutionaries to provide service to our people and community. We should have been there for our people. We knew they wasn't prepared for a natural disaster or a crisis. We knew that. So where were we at? We'll blame everybody else for our own failure to act in our own best interest. Even to this day, and I say this over and over again, I don't give a damn if people get tired of it. We're almost 17 years removed from Hurricane Katrina, and the revolutionary movement have yet to prepare those communities across the country. I'm not part individual. We have certain individuals in many different communities that are prepared. But that's not what this is about. Hurricane Katrina did not destroy our people individually. It destroyed them collectively. The government did not discriminate against our people individually. They discriminate against us collectively. It's our community for, for national disasters. Maybe New Orleans, Louisiana. Is it? No, they're not. But who do we blame for this? Who do we blame for this? Passing our water bills, pass, passing our water bottles and survivor kits is just one aspect of that. Doing the hurricane. Where do I go? How do I evacuate? Who's going to teach me that? Where are the boats? Where are the buses that are going to evacuate us out of these targeted areas? Where are they at? That's the information that we as revolution should provide our people. If we are serious about the revolution, who is they going to get it from? The government? You see what the government did and what they continue to do right now. If we say that we're revolutionary, we're taking on the full responsibility of protecting and defending our people and communities. If we say that we are leaders and we are a government in the service of our people, then we assume the responsibility as any government, as any revolutionary, as any leaders, not just in words, but in actions and deeds. Why is it hard for us to build the resources? Now, one brother earlier today said, Abdul, don't you realize how difficult it is to try to get our people to organize? Yes. Yes, I understand that. And what? Now what? You continue to fight and struggle. No one said the struggle is going to be easy. As revolutionaries, as freedom fighters, we're saying that we have that vision. We have the vision. We're not a part of the dumb, deaf, and blind. We can hear. We can see. We can speak. So what I'm saying is if the brothers and sisters don't understand the importance of unity, we do. We understand that important. We know what it would take to bring our people together. And we know the end results if we don't. We know this. So you can't say, well, man, you know, off the top, if you're a revolutionary and you are a pessimist, you're not a revolutionary. As a revolutionary, we believe that it can be changed, that we can transform to a new society, a new social order, like Comrade George said. So this is what we're fighting for. If that's not what you're fighting for, then you're in the wrong lifestyle. You just in the way then. You cannot be a revolutionary, a servant of the people, and be a pessimist. How can you? Because if I'm following you, we're not going nowhere. Because every time you run into a bump in the road, I don't think we can get there. Man, I'm not following your ass. 
You changed to beyond the bump. As revolutionaries, we visionaries as well. We have a tool that allows us to see things that other people can't see. While most of our people is working hard, living and trying to live in this racist society, we're sitting here analyzing and studying. We're constantly analyzing and studying. That information is going to allow us to see further, to understand more. Just like, you know, we have a saying where what they say, uh, I'm not going to argue with someone that Harry Tubman would chill. So you have brothers and sisters who have never studied the struggle, have never studied what's going on. I'm not going to argue with them. We had a dialogue the other day in where I'm at. And one of the brothers was saying, uh, the government's not going to violate the people's out there uh, First Amendment rights. They're not going to eavesdrop on them. They're not going to listen to the phone calls out there because there's new laws in place. I looked at him. I looked at one of my comrades. I got him to walk away. And hey, where you going, man? I said, I'm not going to debate that. Crack. What am I? You serious? I'm, I'm not wasting my breath on that. The fact that you say that showed me already where you at illogically. It showed me that you got a red, white, and blue wrapped around your shirt. I'm going to sit and talk and argue with you on that. When we know there's evidence after evidence to show that otherwise. So what I'm going to do is debate and argue with a fool. If that's what you believe in, okay, so be it. I'm not here to force you to be free. I can't do that. I can't force you to fight for your liberation. You have to want to. And that brother was red, white, and blue. I said, okay, my brother. I walked away. Nothing else to talk about. I'm not going to argue and debate with him. I'm, I can't transform him the way he think in one day or two days. The argument is insignificant because do that argument, you cannot change him at the end of that argument. If he was a Negro coon two hours ago, he won't be a Negro coon two hours later. That simple. Now, do you create an environment, a climate, where you can chip at it every day? Yes. Yes. We have to create that climate that will encourage our brothers and sisters to eradicate that criminal mentality, that gangster mentality, to transform into something that's going to be productive and positive in the growth and development of our community. One thing we have to understand when it comes to, and this is another reason why Black August is, is relevant, because it's focused on building and prepping our community. If we're serious about the struggle, and we're serious about changing the way we live, changing our own government, not these clowns here, but transforming to a righteous new African government. We have to build a foundation first, and that community is our foundation. If we can't free our own block, we're not going to free our imprisoned nation. If we're not, if we're not, if we're not going to do that, if we're not going to do that, and this is what I mean. The first step, I, oh, excuse me, guys, hold up, hold up, excuse me. Hey, hey. We have to live. All right, big bro. But anyway, like I was saying, is that we have to prepare our community. We have to create a foundation, and we're not doing that. So are we serious? Do we seriously understand the signs of the struggle? And, and I always use these illustrations because people have yet to address those illustrations. I ask many different organizations, do you understand? Do you understand what the government is going to do in, in time of insurrection. Because now they have the technology where they can advance their ideas on how to contain and repress an insurrection. We know for a fact, based on their own documents, one of the things they're going to do is isolate the target area. So let's say they isolate our community. Another thing they're going to do is cut off the power and the water. Do we have our own power source? Do we have our own water source? Then they're going to identify all the visible food sources, like stores, and they're going to hit them with them drones. Now what do we do? 
do we have our own means to feed our people? But we're talking about the revolution, ain't we? Are we not serious? Are we not serious about this government don't give a damn about it and they will do everything in, in its power to keep us oppressed? So if they cut the power off, what are we going to do? Now, we're supposed to be the revolutionary, the freedom fighters. So if they cut the power off, they're going to look at it and say, what you guys going to do about this? That's something that we should have been, been prepared a long time ago. Solar energy, other forms of energy that we can create in our community. So when they do turn the power off, they have the necessary power to keep the refrigerator going. What's stopping us from doing that? If we have our own water source, teach them how to preserve their own water. So in time of emergency like this here, they won't have to rely and depend on that government. Another thing I was explaining to the brothers and sisters is that one thing they will do with that water, they will put certain biological agents in that water. For example, like laxative, a, a strong laxative that will cause it to have diarrhea. An agent that will put us to sleep. So here we are, and I say this all the time. I'm not trying to be funny. Here we are in the middle of a revolution. The majority of our people is laying on the floor sleeping shit on themselves. So what do we do about that? The community is not being prepped. But yet you have everybody running around talking about they revolutionary. How serious are you? You have a lot of these formations that are revolutionary. And they're not fighting for the revolution. And, and to each his own. That's, I'm speaking specifically about those groups that say they are revolutionary. Specifically about those groups talking when they're fighting for the overthrow of this fascist, racist, capitalist, capitalist government. I'm speaking secret to them. You have to prep the communities. Because I guarantee you, the government already has it prepped. What I mean by that, you can rest assured, in every one of our communities, there are snitches and informants in there right now working for the government. Because they understand, because they understand, the government understands, they utilize this science as well. We need these agent informants in the community to give us information that we need on who's who, what is what. We have to get more advanced in our strategies and tactics as it relates to organizing. Not paranoia, but security cops. There's a lot that we can do, and we're not doing it. The science itself is important, because if you understand the science of new African dialectic materialism, slash materialist dialectics, historical materialism, and the science of struggle, it's not saying we're going to be perfect, but we're going to make very few mistakes. Let's go back and analyze the COINTELPRO. There's documents directly related to the COINTELPRO is available. Study it. Study the methods that they use. You still have groups that claim to be revolutionaries today have open door policy. Anybody can come in and recruit. Anybody can come in and be a member, a volunteer. There's no system to vet them out. None whatsoever. But they didn't learn from the original Black Panther Party. Look what happened to them. Those agents of two infiltrated the party because there was no system of standards and procedures on recruitment. There was no vetting system. Before they can go on the inside, just like that clown piece of maggot that got Comrade Fred Hampton assassinated, how the hell did he get that far up to become his security? No check and balances. But you still have people doing that to this day that claim to be the new Black Panthers. Learn from the old Black Panthers. You have to study that. If you really believe in them, you have to study their success their failure, their strengths, and weaknesses. You have to study that. But it's going to help you build for today. It's going to help you build stronger organizations today, starting with recruitment. Take this out. I had a comrade, and we were testing the waters. And I want you guys to hear this. I had a comrade who put on fatigues, black fatigues, a black vest with an AR. He went to the demonstration, and he marched right along with that group. No one questioned him. He's not a member of that group. He was my comrade. No one questioned him. He's wearing a mask to cover his face from the nose down, and then he got the hat on his head. And everybody greeting him like he's a comrade of theirs. 
don't have a clue he's not. And he marched with him for two, three hours. And then he disappeared. No one knew. Why I use that as an example? Because I was trying to show a sister how the government can easily infiltrate those protests and demonstrations. Not even knowing the government have infiltrated. So, sister, so but how do we combat that? You have to know who's there with you. You have to identify those soldiers that's there with you. There must be a way where you can identify them. There must be a mark on that suit that let them know, okay, he's one of ours. I just gave her I just gave her an example. Let's say you have a red, black, and green flag. In the corner of the black part of the flag, there's a tiny red star. Now the dude who infiltrates you may not see that star. So when he put that patch on his back or on his shoulder, it's different than everyone else. He don't belong here. I'm just using that as an example. There's many different ways you can do this. I don't want to expose on this on this program, right? But well, there's many different ways you can do this. You have to, we, if you're serious about the struggle, then you should know the government is serious about putting us down. Especially those of us who claim to represent the people. Especially those of us who claim to be revolutionary. The government's serious talking about taking us down. We know we're fighting for a just cause, but we're dealing with an unjust government, an unjust system. We have to be serious about this, people. Our first priority is protecting our people, our children, our community. Running around the streets with guns is not protection. Preparing them for the fight is protection. Prepping our community to, in defense of that is their protection. Gun clubs is one, so we can teach our people the responsibility of a gun, how to use it, how to clean it. But then S&Ts as well. If a foreign, if a foreign force comes to our community, how do we respond? How do we protect and defend? How do we block our rear? How do we prevent from being in circle? Those things are required because that's what's going to take place if the government say to hell with it. And the white nationalist says, F with it. We Just like recently, what was it, two weeks ago, a white nationalist got caught coming through Inglewood, Los Angeles, in the hood, with five different types of assault weapons. In the hood. Now, let's say he was not identified and exposed. Look what he could have done. One white dude in the car. Because we don't have a clue. We don't even give a damn who drives through our community. There's no form of security whatsoever. And there's no form of organization. And I mean by that, our community is not organized. We're in constant perpetual chaos. And I don't care what planet you're on. An organized force will always destroy a chaotic force. All the time. If you open your hands wide, you have a gap between every finger. That's the point of infiltration. If you close your hand tight like a fist, there's no point of infiltration. That represents unity, a unification. Can't get around that. We as a movement must work towards that fist. I'm part of the guerrilla movement. But I'm, I will work with any brother and sister that's committed to the liberation of our people without compromise. We as Gaidi guerrillas, we don't do all that public demonstration marches. We don't do that. Our collective don't do that. Because that's something that we don't believe in. Right? So we believe that we, you know. Hey, hey, Bomani. Bomani, you hear me, comrade? Yes, I hear you, comrade. All right, that, that, go you. ahead, man. Uh, what do you want to say? Well, uh, I'll just... Um, I'm going to ask right? Hey, what's that? You hear me, Bomani? You hear me, Conrad? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, okay. Um, um, what I was saying is, I'm about to, uh, um, our political struggle, our political involvement, right? 
Um, and I was saying, uh, uh, if, a, if a young individual just comes into the aspect of black organizations, right, and and, and, and they, they wanted to um, create some kind of resistance situation in a particular environment, right, where would you ask, what would you tell them to start? I mean, before you do anything, you have to understand, are you prepared for that? Because that's what I'm saying. You can't just jump into where I want to create a, a position of resistance. No, learn how to resist and what that means. And learn how they're going to respond to your resistance. That's important. Because if I don't know how my enemy is going to respond, my resistance don't mean nothing. Can I defend myself? Can I live that life of a resistor? You got to teach yourself. A lot of people just come out and know and say, yeah, give me a gun, I'm going to resist. That's not resistance, my brother. Preparing yourself and prepping yourself and prepping the community to speak to resistance. So let's say a young brother wants to come into the bar, Black Arts of Resistance. We encourage you to learn everything you need to know about weapons, self-defense, martial arts, evacuation, security, mobilization, guerrilla warfare. Learn all that. And your point of resistance when you go to the community and take that knowledge to them. First, A, how to use a computer, how to use all of that technology. It's not about just one individual act of resistance. When we talk, when we speak about bar, we're talking about a culture of resistance. So that brother or sister must learn all they need to know and take it back to the community and teach them how to resist, teach them to prepare themselves for resistance. You just can't pop out nowhere and say, I want to know, train, learn. As, like if you look at the enemy, the government, they don't just pull a fool off the street and say, oh, here go a gun, go shoot. They train that clown. They train them, especially the military, especially special forces. They train them. Why should we do any less? When we speak about bar, we're talking about a culture of resistance. We're talking about our people. We ain't talking about an individual. What we do say as an individual, we must train ourselves up to par so we can help and and teach our people about the importance of resistance. That's how you can perpetuate the culture, uh, culture of resistance, not just because you go somewhere and shoot. Remember, Comrade Katari, Johnson, William Christmas, James McClain, Rochelle, W.L., Young Cleve, Alvin Miller, and George, as well as the comrades uh, 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 Willie Tate, David Johnson, Fleeter Drumgold, they were all part of a movement. They were not individuals. They were all part of a movement that trained. They exercised. They studied and read. When you look at all those days and individuals, they link from the same movement, the same group. They link. This was no separate uh, issues here. So when you have a brother or sister who were to try to better understand the cultural resistance, it start with you first. The cultural resistance. The first thing, go train. The second thing, I want you to read these books here. I want you to read about Davy Walker, Martin Delaney, Demar Vesey, Robert Williams. I want you to read because they represent their cultural resistance. I want you to read George. I want you to read about these individuals who perpetuate our cultural resistance. Read while you train. And while you're reading and training, you can recruit among your people that you know, your family members, your brothers and sisters. That's what you have to do. That's what their culture means. The culture doesn't represent the individual, it represents the people. So if that individual is coming to fully understand bar, black arts resistance, it starts with you. It starts with yourself. Are you fully prepared? Go join the martial arts. Go join the gun club. Go join the survival class. Pick up books on guerrilla warfare, strategies and tactics. Get you a paintball club so you can go out there and use those strategies with paintball guns. Prepare yourself. Learn all you need to learn about first A, how to stitch a weapon. I mean, how to stitch a wound, a, a bullet wound and a knife wound. Learn all that. And you can teach simultaneously. It's not just about the weapons, it's about why you're doing this. So it starts with that person right there, Bomani, and he must be prepared or she must be prepared. When you speak about the culture resistance. True indeed. 
you know, um, you know, previous in the conversation, um, you had mentioned um, various phases of ideological struggle and various phases of revolutionary advancement. Uh, you mentioned nationalism, black nationalism, revolutionary nationalism, black revolutionary black nationalism, and the African revolution nationalism, right? Uh, what, what is significant? Uh, what is significant? All these four stages, and what does it actually mean in regards to expressing black art resistance, in regards to commemorating black? Art, what is it, what did all those stages mean in particular? Okay. What is significant? Remember, even within prison, right? Even within prison, let's use this: the prison environment. Those four ideology evolved within prison within the prison movement itself, the black prison movement itself. Prison movement was first initiated by brothers in prison, late 50s, early 60s. The primary ideology at the time was nationalism. It had nothing to do with uh, the, the, the political studies and historical aspect. It was coming together as a people in defense of our people, right? That stage did not solve all the problems. We were still faced with that same oppression and intensified. A natural progression takes place when you're involved in the ideological struggle. Black nationalism came to play, right? Now that means now you got your culture in front of you now. So it's not just about unity; it's about educating ourselves, political studies. It's about coming together as a people. Now you're dealing with black nationalism. You're dealing with your people. You're Pacific now. That did not meet the demands of the people within this environment. With the introduction of the Black Panther Party and the Nation of Islam, like Malcolm X, who was a revolutionary black nationalist, the Black Panthers, though they were communism, communists, they were revolutionary black nationalists. So when those ideas came behind the walls, many of the prison activists inside prison incorporated them ideas. And it began to evolve into a revolutionary black nationalism. And at that time, this was the most effective way in fighting racial oppression in this country. Now, remember, the streets were going through the same struggle. In 67, 68, when the ideas started formulating with regards to the New African Independence Movement, New African Revolutionary Nationalism, they went through the same stages. Prior to NAR, prior to the uh, New African Independence Movement, revolutionary black nationalism was the primary ideology in society. Prior to that, it was black nationalism. And we go further back into the years of slavery with nationalism. But then you have individuals like Demar Vesey, David Walker. They themselves were more advanced because they were advocating revolutionary black nationalism. And then they were advocating independence. So even in the same environment, you have certain people on different levels of the ideological development. Our, our guerrilla collective was more advanced because of comrades like George W. Nolan, Howard Toll, Tony Gibson, and William Christmas and others that I can't mention, as you know, as well as others, right? It advanced to the stage of New African Revolution nationalism. That's relevant because Black August, Memorial Black August resistance is the direct manifestation of that process. How it was perceived in 78 and 79 is totally different how it was implemented in 1881 because now you have an ideological base. Black August is not a coon celebration. It's not a black nationalist celebration. It's not a nationalist celebration. It's a revolutionary nationalist celebration, meaning that we're fighting for independence. This is a commemoration period that allows to facilitate that process, commemorate not only our comrades, but continue to fight in the service of the revolution. So it's not just, it's not, it's nowhere near a celebration. So people need to get that out of the head. It's not a celebration, it's not a holiday. Right? This is a way of life. And when we deal with Black Hawk Memorial, we pay homage to those brothers and sisters, especially behind the walls, who gave their life to the struggle, who made that ultimate sacrifice to the struggle. Black Hawk resistance is the perpetuation of our culture. And even in that content, prior to Black August, like Kwanzaa and other things, did not meet the demands of our people. But Black August will. So Black August is rooted in the struggle of independence. Bomani? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, um, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was listening to what you were saying. Uh, um, um, uh, I, I want to know how, how, how did how did Black August um morph to the aspect of new African nationalism and to a new African independent movement? How, how, how did how did it develop? You know, in regard to that standpoint. And what does that okay, actually mean? Okay, let me say this here. In the same process, when I was speaking about David Walker, Martin Delaney, did my best. Even in that time, we're talking about two, three hundred years ago, in eighteen hundred. They were fighting for independence. They at that time was already in the stage of New African Revolution nationalism. Even Martin Delaney used the term New Africa, but it was very few. Okay, now let's fast forward. At the time, the idea of or the concept of Black August came about, there was an ideological struggle within the formation. You have those staunch communists, you have those staunch revolution black nationalists, and you have those who were new African revolution nationalists. You had internal contradiction within our organization. But those countries, so at the time the concept was built, the primary ideology at that time of some individuals was communism and revolution of black nationalism. But you had those who embraced new African revolution nationalism that was there. In 79, again, those brothers that was part of that communist community and within our organization, the revolutionary black nationalist community, many of them began to embrace NAR because they see that that was the final interpretation. They realized communism belonged to somebody else. The Marxists, the Lenin, they pushed that shit all the way out the pocket. And because the facts remain, that was not based on our struggle. So many of the brothers and sisters that were communists within the organization, they realized through ideological development that that Marxist, that Lenin was not for us because it did not speak to us. It's not based on our concrete reality or our conditions. So many of them realized that. They realized then that Norm was the next stage. Many of the revolution black nationalists understood that as well, more so because they understand the process of dialectical materialism. They themselves began to embrace new African revolution nationalism. And this is about like 80, 81 now. Now, when we look at 80, 81, we full blown non new African revolution nationalism. We full blown in the service of fight for the liberation and independence of our people. And our ideology was new African revolution and nationalism. Now, when you look at Black August, now remember, Black August is creation of our organization. We are the sole proprietor of that. And we are a new African revolutionary organization. We did not produce a cool American Negro commemoration. It was, our ideology gave birth to that. So how does that apply to Black August? This is the foundation by which we launch and continue to teach people about our revolutionary struggle. This is the foundation where we train and educate people about culture resistance. Why about the culture resistance? We're fighting for the liberation and independence of our people. It's not just, well, okay, we need to resist. No, we ain't just talking about, well, here go your picket sign and go down the street and go protest. No, we're talking about cultural resistance. We understand that our people need to embrace that cultural resistance. And we believe that with David Walker, Martin Delaney, Ben Marvesi, uh, Nat Turner, Robert Williams, what they were doing was more effective in addressing our needs. Black August provides us with that opportunity, especially the aspect of Black August resistance. When we say Black August resistance, we ain't talking about individuals. We're talking about a culture of resistance on many different levels, on many different fronts. This resistance must be in harmony in conjunction with our capacity, but also in conjunction with our desire to be free and understanding that in order for us to be free, we must resist. Protecting and defending our community, our people, is part of that resistance. Developing our own economic base is part of that resistance. So we're resisting the capitalist structure. When we develop our own department of agriculture, acquire land to feed our people, that's also a form of resistance. So we're resisting the system. This culture resistance is a culture. It's always been our culture. We can go back to Africa. It's always been our culture. But going through this acculturation process, we have been reorientated and re indoctrinated to think like Americans. Damn, everybody sound like Obama. Opposed to 
Nat Turner, opposed to David Walker, opposed to Marcus Garvey or Robert Williams. Our cultural resistance would take us back to our true intent and purpose. It would take us back to who we truly are as a people. Our story as a people from Africa to here speaks to that warrior uh, uh, spirit, speaks to that warrior consciousness. We have been resisting since day one as a people. I'm not talking about individuals, as a people. Yes, sir. But we have, once we got here, the process of trying to break us, unfortunately, for many, it worked. And, I don't, and I don't, I'm not talking about a person doing senseless violence. That don't mean nothing. Because you get a gun and shoot 10 of your people, that's not resisting. That's silliness. That's not, that has nothing to do with resistance. And that don't make you tough or bad. Speak about resisting. We speak about the people who have raised up and said enough is enough. And we're willing to do whatever it takes to protect and defend ours and build our own and defend that by which we build. It is, it is not, I mean, you can put it in simple terms, right? But you're not talking about just individuals. You're talking about our people. We're talking about a culture of resistance. Don't get slapped in the face and turn the other chicken and kick, get kicking your ass. <laughs> Soon he raises his hand, you behead his ass. I'm, I'm using this metaphorically. So don't, I'm not saying behead, no, I'm saying I'm just using this metaphorically. You know, we defend ourselves. We protect and defend our loved ones, our community. You know, if you getting beat up, I'm not going to be holding my cell phone recording that. The fuck is that? I'm going to shut it off. Don't need no witnesses. Yes, sir. I go ahead, but my. Okay. Um, it, 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 um, how, how do you actually uh, how you actually defend the integrity of Black August? For instance, I'm saying like it's a lot of um, propagation. I know talking about different things regarding Black August. It uh, did not the truth of it and positivity and uh, deceptions of the matters. How do you go about defending the integrity of Black August? How do a person go about defending it? If you have the truth, you know. Folks, check this out. First of all, just look at how they got that misinformation. There's, there's a source to that. The system isolated those of us who are responsible, the organization that are responsible for Black August Memorial and Black August Resistance, the system effectively isolated us. So it was hard for us to get the information out, even though we had Comrade Shaka out there under the Black August Organizing Committee doing what he can do, but he was under the gun as well. You know what I'm saying? He couldn't just do what he did. They were after him out there. So what I'm saying is that a lot of people didn't get all the facts. A lot of people didn't know the history. You got people saying that Black August started in 1971 after the death of Comrade George. That's not true. You saying that Black August started in 78 because of Comrade George. That's not true. Then they say Qatari started Black August before he died. That's not true. But this is information out there because the truth has yet to be exposed. Because it was hard for us at one time, because we was all in isolation and solitary confinement to get the information out there. And anytime you mention Black August, you're gonna get booked. You can get 30, 60, 90 days just for mentioning Black August in your letters or material. But we didn't care. We keep on trying. We kept riding by, and they kept booking us and booking us. So it's hard to get the information out there. So what people did have, they work with that and they add something to it. You know, they even add some of the comrades to the commemoration part. They even begin to interpret and reinterpret certain things because they didn't have nothing to go by. I believe that most of them were just trying to do what they can, and some was intentionally trying to disfigure Black August to meet their own little trips. Being that we're out here now, on the streets, everywhere now, we are now in a better opportunity or better place where we can teach the truth about Black August. And there's a lot of brothers and sisters out there that want to know the truth. And who better know the truth than the organization that created Black August? I've been involved in Black August over 40 years. It was our organization that created Black August. So who better know about Black August than we do? So that, and that's where the organizational arrogance come into play. You have organizations trying to tell us what Black August is. I'm not debating with this fool. How are you going to argue with the organization that created Black August, what Black August is not. That right there, tell me your intent is not right. That tell me from the beginning, your intent is not, 
you having bad intentions then. It's, 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 sure. and it's like uh, I, my thing is I'm trying to bite my tongue, but my thing is that we're in trouble as a people because the, sh- the crap that we do to each other, the crap that we do, especially when we call ourselves revolutionary. Are you serious about this struggle? Are you serious about Black August? Because if you're serious about Black August, then you need to learn about that. Who can you learn from it better? Either from us or someone we talk. Don't go sure. Google that crap. Because <laughs> when you Google it, this shit's all twisted up. Yeah, I already know. Don't man. go to what that West Westpedia, whatever that crap is. You ain't gonna find the truth in that. You have the opportunity now that we've been getting out. You have the opportunity to learn the truth about Black Hawk Resistance and Black Hawk Memorial. The ain't this what it's about? You can't run around here with talking about integrity, but yet what you're doing is crooked. A lot of these brothers know who we are. They know we exist. But they don't want they don't want they don't want to talk to us at all because they know we know we're gonna expose their ass. You know, if you serious about Black August, you seriously believe in George and Qatari and W L and those brothers who gave us their life, then you have no problem coming to the truth then. No problem. And when I told one brother that when the ideal or concept first came about, it was after the death of Jeff Guitar Golden that inspired that. The other comrade was added, but it was the death of our comrade, the Fallen Dragon, that inspired this concept. And I also always tell people, one of the brothers asked me, man, uh, Suja said he created that. And somebody else said, nah. No one individual created Black Ark. That's bull crap. The ideal was brought to the exercise yard. And many comrades on the exercise yard in AC took that ideal. Shared with comrades on the yard in Old Wing and Solidaire. Shared with comrades in North Block in San Quentin. Shared with comrades in Tracy. And shared with comrades in Folsom Prison. Those four prisons. And comrades contribute to this process. Then you had comrades on the streets. Sisters like Mama Ayana, McKinney, Kashefu, and other Adama. Other sisters out there who contribute towards that ideal as well. Ma'amuna. So it's not created by no one person. The organization and this movement created Black August. Because everybody contributed towards its its growth and development. It was a concept that the organization breathed life into. Not one person did that. And even today, as we evolve, more comrades are continuing to contribute towards this growth and development. Even when you have comrades that are committed to teaching the truth about Black August, they play a role in the growth and development of Black August. They playing a role in that process. All right, Bomani. You there, Bomani? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? I hear you down. You want me a car? You want me a car, right? When I was done, I was done. Okay. Um, what I was saying, I thank you for coming to the platform to show you now you understand it. And um, thank you for the work you did in the past, the present, and the future, right? You know, I want to open a line for a couple of callers. If anybody got any statements or comments or you want to get involved in the conversation, please press 1. If you got any call, comments, statements, suggestions, or uh, shout-out, please press 1. If you want to get involved in the conversation right now. I want to open a couple of lines up, man, see what's happening. Please press 1 at this time. Got anything to say? Okay, let me open. I got a line. Um, nine zero one two nine two. Your line is open. If you got any questions, comments, statements? Please do so at your time. Nine zero one nine two nine two. Your line is open. Go ahead. Free the land, Baba Shakur, Mama Ayo. Okay. All right. What's up? 
How you doing, Mama? Are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Um, I have a couple. Yeah. Of course, I enjoyed. Yes, I enjoyed you last week, and of course, uh, you know, master teacher, as usual. <laughs> um, I congrat. I, I congratulate. Um, you know. Black August Memorial, Black August Resistance, of course. Um, my question, uh, because I'm coming from um, an aspect of, of being inside of the Republic of New Africa, you you know that our um, our strategy uh, uh, coming into this administration was to uh, encourage new Africans to get into work, study, and training. Uh, can you comment on whether that is a good strategy because what we're trying to do is what you spoke about. How can you be a cadre? How can you be of of, uh, of, uh, importance to your community, of service to your community, if you are not in work, study, and training? And how can you be verified if people don't know who you are, you haven't come to a process with other comrades so that we can make sure that you are not uh, sent to the best of our ability, you're not a sense, you're not a, you're not a plan. Um, can you speak to that, please? Yeah. See, see, one thing people need to understand too, right? Cadre doesn't have to be necessary. Five, three, two people. One person can become a cadre, and this is about quality, not quantity. So, if you can train one individual, and that one individual is committed to training, that he or she in himself is a cadre. So a lot of times when we look at small numbers, we say, well, it's not, it's not working. No, it is working. That's why we say chosen few. It is working. Because now you got the brothers and sisters who are committed to the change, committed to the training. So if you identify four or five brothers and sisters that are committed to the training, each one of them become a cadre. So let's say you get a sister who's committed to the training and committed to the teaching. She's a cadre in herself because she's now become a cadre leader. Now it's her job to go recruit and build our cadre. So you go back to your community, go door to door, work with the people, train the people, get to know those people, maybe family members, what have you, and you begin to build your cadre for that particular territory. So I'm saying, if you even got one individual that's willing to train, that's a cadre. And you build that one cadre then. And that individual will be responsible for building the cadre himself or herself. Even when the original panther was doing the five and ten. You take one person and build a cadre of five. You take five to build a cadre of ten. That same process. It's going to take one person and build a cadre. So if you got six people from six different areas, and each of them are committed and dedicated to educating and training, you take that one individual and send them right back to the community. You're responsible for organizing in that community. You're responsible for going door-to-door in that community. You're responsible for building your cadre in that community. And you train him in terms of or her in terms of how to build a cadre, how to secure that cadre, how do you recruit, how do you prevent infiltration and penetration. So all those things you teach him or her and send them back out there. And they will be responsible for teaching the community and building their cadre. So let's say I'm going door to door and I set up a program where every you know, four or five people in the community come to my house, we have dialogue, talk. I may be looking at one individual in their house that is more receptive to what I'm saying. And I always know in the back of my head, okay, she's the one. The rest of them still good, but she's the only one that's ready for this process. I'm going to pull her to the side later on down the way, maybe two, three days later, and talk to her. Because I know she's more receptive than the rest of them are. Now I just train another cadre member. Even before I bring them to the cadre, I'm going to train them. And once I see that they are qualified and they're more serious about it, then I bring them to my cadre. Now it's two of us. So there's many different steps you can take, right? But again, if you got one, one Mama Ayo, that's a cadre in themselves. So it, it, you don't have to have the numbers. The numbers don't mean nothing. It's the quality of each that's individual. So, so you got qualified individuals that are committed to the training. That they themselves are a cadre, and they can go out and disperse themselves. Maybe five, six, three, or two. It don't matter. Got you. All right. That's wonderful. So, so when we talk about um, Uneven development. That is what has happened over the last, in, in, in our assessment over the last 10 years, and what we are facing within the, the nation right now is that you've had uh, so called 
brothers and sisters who claim to be uh, new African conscious citizen workers, and they, at this particular time, based on their actions, not their words, they are unwilling, unwilling to go into work, study, and training. And that has been uh, assessed from our objective assessment. That is the reason why uh, this particular nation isn't as strong and as organized as it should be. And we're trying to uh, figure out strategies as to why uh, our brothers and sisters are unwilling to go into the process of work, study, and training because I know that we're facing life ups and downs. The nation isn't organized to give everyone a job, to put them on the land, to educate them, to provide medical services, to provide what they need. But we need, we need citizen workers with their different gifts to be committed to this process, and yet they are unwilling to go into work, study, and training at this particular time. See? So what are some now, strategies? See, here go the thing. Now, if I got a comrade, and he's a gorilla, and he refused to go to a private, like we call R&I, orientation indoctrination, he refused to go through that process. You're not a gorilla, fool. Get the hell out of here. Because if you're committed to this, you understand the importance of going through this process of training and education. You can't be a new African. You can't be a citizen when you refuse to train accordingly. You lose that. It's that simple. That's like saying, well, okay, I'm, I'm a citizen, but yet I have allegiance to a red, white, and blue. There's a contradiction in that. So if I'm serious about this here, and I'm committed to this nation, then I'm going to learn and train accordingly, period. If I'm not doing that, then something ain't right in that person's commitment. Something ain't right. If you go back and study, those are the same individuals that the government used, the agent provocateurs, because they were not grounded within the beliefs of the Black Panther Party or the Black Liberation Army or the Black Guerrillas. They were not conscious. They were not rooted in that. In order to be rooted in that ideologically, you're going to do what is necessary to learn all that you need to know to support that if you believe in it. If you believe and you truly believe in that 100%, why is it so hard for you to train and educate yourself to it? That's a contradiction. You obviously don't believe in it because your action didn't reflect that. You judge a person by what they do, not by what they say. If I say, well, I'm a new African citizen, but yet I refuse to go through the necessary training. There's a problem there then. So there's a contradiction. Because you have a love and, and desire to be that and you believe in that, your actions and deeds will be a direct manifestation of that belief. Period. It's that simple. You can't get around that. If a person just like in here, we don't, we tell them a gorilla is known through his actions. Indeed, we don't care what your mob say. We don't care. Oh man, I kill ten people. We don't, we don't care about all that crap. If you believe in what we believe in, and you serious about this here, your actions and deeds will be that. You know our constitution. You know our bylaws and codes of ethics. You know we don't sell drugs or use hard drugs. You know this. But once you stick that needle in your arm, you're not this. Regardless of what you call yourself, you can't be this when you got that needle in your arm or you selling heroin and cocaine to your people. You can't be this. It's impossible. It's no different within the Republic of New Africa, my sister. If you says about this here and you refuse training, what identify you as that is your training, is your knowledge of that. So if you're not going through that training and getting that education, how can you say you're that? You can't. It's going through the training. Just like when we was coming up, we had to go through what we call an orientation indoctrination process. We had to go to PE. We had to go through all that. Even before we call ourselves a gorilla, we had to go through this training first. We had to learn our constitution, all our operational documents. We had to learn all that. Once you learn that and you become a direct manifestation of that, then they say, okay, he is a gorilla. Until then, I'm not. I'm a civilian. Either I'm trying to learn or I'm, a perpetra- I'm perpetrating. Now, one may say, well, I don't have enough time. Okay, then you adjust it. Whereas, for example, you, got, you watch sports every week, and they say, yeah. Okay, what's more important? You learning and training or watching a damn football game? Well, man, that's my re- See, nah. 
Because if you're serious, it takes you every Sunday when it comes to professional football, there's four or five hours of sports. You can't take 30 minutes out to train, to learn. You can't give us 30 minutes, 15 minutes, 45 minutes. We're fighting for the liberation of our people, those who died for us. You can't give 14 minutes, 15, 20 minutes of your time. And you say that you're a citizen of the Republic of New Africa. Yeah, I pledge allegiance to the flag. Yeah, red, white, and blue. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, Baba. Absolutely, Baba. Yeah. Uh, I yield to the next person. If there's no one else that wants to ask you another question, I have more. But but I yield right now. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. We appreciate it, Mama. I got another call. We appreciate this. Uh, okay. Uh, the next call is 901-480. you have any questions, comments, statements, please do through the time. 901-480. line is open. Go ahead. Free the land, free the land. It's with the Manny Queen. How you doing, Baba? You know, great, <laughs> oh, great, no. great show. Yeah. Another great show. Hey, Mr. Bo Money, Mama Ayo. I'm good, I'm good. Doing tonight? Free the land, yeah. free the land. Remain and define, yeah. my sister. <laughs> Most definitely. Like I said, I can't wait. We got it coming up, but I have a few <laughs> questions. Uh, I want to ask right. you about, you know, you were talking about sexism, right? The sexism yeah. that we have going on um, today is killing our revolution, right? How do we deal yeah. with it? Because we have a lot of men that do not want to accept female um, authority, right? Or even our input in this. Because I mean, I don't, I don't understand how 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 are we gonna work this out with our with our men. See, what we do, and we cut and dry. Those individuals that is not willing to accept the leadership, because it's not just about, oh, yeah, she's a woman. No, this is the leadership within the organization. And you are obligated to subordinate yourself to leadership within the organization. Don't make that who they are, women or men. If you can't do that, then go somewhere else. You got to leave. Because we're not going to cater to your contradiction. We're not going to cater to your sexism. We're not going to give you a place where that sexism can live and exist. We've seen what it did to the original Black Panther Party. Even among ourselves, even among our collective, it existed. But no, if you cannot accept this leadership, it's leadership before there's a sister or brother. There's leadership here. You played and took an oath to this organization, to this movement, to this nation. And if you can't adhere to it, then you got to go then. Take that backward ass shit back to the cave. It's that simple. You don't compromise with this clown. You get him out of there. Simple as that. You got to go. And then the brothers who are serious about it, they should be backing you guys up. You got to go, man. If you can't accept her leadership, you got to go. Because you're not backing it up, you're doing the same damn thing then. Because if I say I'm committed to this here, and this is our leader, and this is a sister, then you won't adhere to it then. If not, then you got to go. And you refuse to enforce that you got to go. It's that simple. You can't get around that. Because if you sit here and let that shit happen, you know different than him then. Because deep down in, in your heart, you think the same way then. Because if you didn't, you would have spoke out against it. You'd be standing up there, nah, bro, you got to go, man. We ain't going to tolerate this here. We're not going to accept this crap. And that's what the brothers in there that don't believe that crap need to start doing. Simple as that, man. A person is known through their actions and deeds, not by what they say. I can sit there and say, man, I'm against sexism, but yet I'm going to watch a brother disrespect a sister because she's in a leadership position. But I'm not going to say nothing. Hell no, I'm going to say something. And unfortunately, I might do something. So I'm just saying, no, you don't do this. And I'm saying, I tell all sisters, if you're in an organization where the brothers don't respect you, then that's not the right organization for you then. Then you should have to fight among your own brothers. We're fighting for the liberation of our people. And then these so-called brothers create another environment for you to fight. Now you're fighting against them. They become your oppressors. Now I got to fight against you and the oppressors? Come on, man. You don't really believe in fighting the oppressor then. Because you can justify how you oppressing the sister in the struggle. And this was your comrade. You justify oppressing her. Man, you ain't serious about this struggle. You're a contradiction. You're a contradiction. 
So no, nah, it shouldn't even be there. And the brothers that's there should be taking a stand against that. So they understand this is not going to be tolerated here. Simple as that. Period. I, Remove them. Get the I, get them the hell out of there. Go join the caveman organization. I say, Throw I rocks say, and chase totally dinosaurs agree. or something. <laughs> I totally agree. I totally agree. And then when you were talking about these agent provocateurs, right, like the um, the MVP and these gun clubs we got around here, but our black communities are unprotected and being attacked every day, right? Um, how do we uh, deal with that? Because, like you said, our struggle is not going to be monolithic, right? But I know, like, when I get ready to go to the, walk over to the store, you know, to the corner store in my neighborhood, I know these brothers out here, they so, they so weak and sorry. I know for a fact that none of them are going to stand up for me. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. you know, and, and, and then, like I said, like the MVP, they are not like the original Black Panther. Period. At, at all. But they walking around with these new suits on, these big old guns, but they still, our communities are unprotected. What 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 do you think about this? See, see, the thing is, and in part, that's accurate, right? And true. No, no disputing that, right? But the thing is this here, right? In order to better that situation, we have to establish a clear line of communication, right? Uh, if I punch you in the mouth, you're not going to listen to me. I'm only using this symbolically, right? But if I sit you down, we talk and understand the importance of securing our community, they may listen. So if I elbow you in the mouth and say, your organization ain't shit, you ain't going to never listen to me. <laughs> you see what I'm saying, yeah. sis? You ain't going to never listen yeah. to me. Because now you just punch my mouth. My mouth is bleeding. Out of the hell with her. She walks to the store by a goddamn self. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So there's S and T's, there's strategy and tactics and all that we do. You know what I'm saying? We must give that individual a reason to protect and defend us. We must give that individual that reason. You know? So if I'm trying to unite with other brothers and sisters, I'm not going to punch them in the mouth and say, help me. I'm going to sit down and say, we have a need here that needs to be addressed. We have sisters that's walking down this street that is being subjected to disrespect, if not violence. We need you brothers and sisters to help us. Teach us how to use a gun, teach us martial arts, but also have a presence there to discourage this type of behavior. You know, so, again, if they sincere and serious about this, they will respond. A revolution is known through his or her actions and deeds. When you present that to them, either they're going to respond or they're not, and then the people can watch and see that themselves. Because if I'm talking about training and defending my community, it starts right there at home. If sisters can't go to the local store without being harassed, then that's a reflection of those groups of men in that community or sisters who claim to be that in the community. It don't take nothing to have a brother or two brothers or sisters present while you walk to the store. It takes nothing. So what I'm saying is this here. In order for us to reach them, we can't punch them in the mouth. We have to sit them down and say, man, we got certain areas in the community that's not safe for our women, our children. And we need some type of presence there. You know? So there's something that you have to reason with them. And, they, and if they're sincere in their endeavors and they are sincere and committed to this struggle, then the I should not see them have no problem having people out there doing a time and period where our sisters, our children is playing or they're going to work or they're going to the store. If that's possible, if they got the people available, right? Because, again, yeah. a lot of them might be working at certain hours, so you identify those who are not working at that hour. So if you got two or three that's not working at an hour, they should be able to present themselves. Remember, if you're saying that this is part of the struggle, TV, entertainment should not prevent you from doing this. Social media should not prevent you from doing this. You shouldn't be able to call me and say, and I'll tell you what, hold on, man. I'm, I'm, watching, the, uh, 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 I'm watching the reality show Survivor. Uh, I'll get back at you when it's over with. Who the crap is that? <laughs> no. Yeah. You don't, you don't, it, it, no, if I'm a revolutionary, 